How are we saved by grace through faith? Well, what is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And over, over and over throughout the New Testament, you have the phrase, the hope of eternal life. How is a child of God saved? The child of God is saved by believing the promises of God as they relate to the Son of God, who is the Christ, that he paid the penalty for their sin, and he has promised them eternal life. And to believe in him is to have eternal life, because eternal life is not a destination. Eternal life is not a future event. Eternal life is a person. Be patient, be patient in problems. Be patient in problems. Sean Isaacs here. Welcome to another day of Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. I'm on a little bit later than usual, but I wanted to be consistent and share just a quick thought. Many of you are in situations right now, difficult situations, problems right now. What can you do? Well, my, my encouragement is to be patient. Be patient in problems. Be patient in problems. You and I have a tendency to get out of problems the same way we got into them. Generally, it's one step at a time. So I want to share that little nugget of wisdom with you today. Uh, I just had the pleasure, Faith, good to see you. I just had the pleasure of uh, having lunch with one of my clients who have become a couple that have become good friends and um, one of the challenges that they're facing right now is concern about their children Uh, they have older children that are not walking with God but more importantly there are substance abuse problems there are drug issues And, uh, you know, I was just sharing with them my thoughts, and one of the things I encourage them to do is to be patient in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the problem. And by patient, I don't mean be passive. I don't mean don't be engaged. I I don't mean don't care. A lot of times when we're under pressure is when we make bad decisions. We become overly anxious, and we violate principles of scripture like be careful some of your translations would say be anxious for nothing be careful for nothing be anxious for nothing and so my encouragement today and my nugget of wisdom is be patient in problems you and I get out of problems generally the same way we got into them one step at a time it's not there is very few challenges or problems or trials or circumstances that you and I face that just happen. You know, if you have a house burned to the ground, that's something that may just have happened. If you were in Hurricane Dorian and you lost your home or lost your business or even lost loved ones, that's something that kind of just happened. But if you're in the middle of a bad marriage, if you are in the midst of financial, uh, you know, I was looking for another word, but let's say financially you feel devastated. Uh, If you're in the middle of a bad relationship, maybe your children disrespect you, there's no honor. Your children are not walking in obedience to you. Maybe they're not following the things of God in the way you have raised them. My encouragement to you is you need to be patient. 
You didn't get to where you are overnight. These things didn't just happen. I think one of the the best things you and I can do when we're in the midst of a storm, when, there, when we're in the middle of problems or challenges that, are, that, that appear to be bigger than we are, and by that I mean when I say appear to be bigger than we are, I'm implying that they're not bigger than you because God will never allow into the life of any of his children that which we are unable to bear. And I, there's a qualifier there. You've heard the people quote a text often, God will not put on us more than we can bear. That's not really a true, accurate statement or a accurate quotation of what the text says. There are things that we cannot bear alone. God never meant for us to bear things alone. That's why the scripture says, bear one another's burdens, and in so, fulfill the, in, in so doing, we fulfill the law of Christ. That's Galatians 6. So we're not to carry burdens alone. We're not to bear trouble or problems by ourselves. To do it by yourself is not wise, and this is why many people quit, many people faint, many people give up, some even take their own life, sadly, and other things. We're not meant to bear things alone. God has always built his world so that we can be interdependent. Not just dependent on God, but upon one another. That's why we are to forgive one another. We're to pray for one another. We're to comfort one another. We're to love one another. We're to confess our sins one to another. If you just trace all the one another's throughout scripture, you'll see there are a lot of things you can't do you can't have a relationship with God and not have a re relationship with God's people. So with that being said, there are very few problems or challenges or trials or circumstances that you and I are involved with today that happened overnight. Health issues, for example. Health issues, generally, they don't happen overnight. You don't wake up one day and you have cancer. Yeah, you may have woke up today and found out you had cancer, but if you understand generally how cancer works, it's not generally growing overnight. I know doctors say, oh, it was a fast growing cancer. To me, that's doctor's language for there's nothing we can do. And since we cut you or we, what we've prescribed isn't working, you know, the outcome of all of that is it's growing too fast. Right? Most people that know how cancer works knows that it's not something that grows overnight. Right? So whether it's a whether whether it's an illness or it's a addiction or it's a financial challenge or it's problems in the home, problems in the church, be patient in the problems. Why? Because we tend to get out of problems, out of trials, out of situations, out of difficulty one step at a time. It doesn't happen overnight. We get out the same way we got in, right? And so a good text to memorize, to think about, to meditate upon is Romans 12, verse 12. It's easy to remember because it's Romans 12, verse 12. Many Christians know Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And even the unsaved world, the unbelieving world, understand, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There are agnostics and atheists that quote that text, though they may not even know it's out of the Bible, that we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. But a verse that I can think that's, that's far more powerful when you're going through difficulty or you're in the midst of problems is... Romans 12:12, 12, 12, which says, I'm going to try to remember and paraphrase it. It says, rejoicing in hope, patient in trouble, um, and constant in prayer. I think that's, uh, that's a loose paraphrase. All right? Prayer, hope, and patience. The three words that are critical to helping you and I go through problems. Let me go through them as quick as I can. Number one, I love the phrase, it says rejoicing in hope. Some of your texts would say being joyful in hope. 
What is that teaching? Well, what it's teaching, you know, there's a huge debate among the people of God about, you know, the, 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 you know, whether you can lose your salvation. It's a huge debate. It's nothing new. It's been going on for hundreds of years. You know, can you lose your salvation? The Calvinist says you can't. The Armenian says you can, generally. You can lose your salvation. And both have texts to prove their point. I believe that debate would be better understood if we understand how we're saved. We're saved by grace through faith. Faith, Yes, 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 yes. I know, I know. That's Ephesians 2. We're saved by grace through faith. That's not of ourselves. It's a gift from God. But that's not the only way we're saved. How are we saved by grace through faith? Well, what is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And over, over and over throughout the New Testament, you have the phrase, the hope of eternal life. How is a child of God saved? The child of God is saved by believing the promises of God as they relate to the Son of God, who is the Christ, that he paid the penalty for their sin, and he has promised them eternal life. And to believe in him is to have eternal life, because eternal life is not a destination. Eternal life is not a future event. Eternal life is a person. So Jesus is life, and the scripture says, if Christ is in you, he is not only the life, he is the resurrection and the life. And if that, if you are connected to the life, you will have life. Hopefully that's not too complex. But what's my complex, too complicated? What's my point there? When Paul says rejoicing in hope, what is the hope that the child of God is rejoicing in? They're rejoicing in the reality that their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That one day they're going to see Christ face to face. First John says, everyone that has the hope of seeing Jesus face to face, of living etern eternally, right? That everyone that has this hope purifies himself. This, this hope leads to holy living, leads to pure living. Whatever this hope is, it leads to separation for the child of God. Because as he is, John says, so are we in the world. So again, what's my point? P Paul says, rejoicing in hope. Rejoicing in hope. You don't want to rejoice in things that are changeable. You don't want to rejoice in, ch in things that can be taken away. You want to rejoice in things that are immutable, unchangeable. And the hope of the child of God is fixed if their faith is genuine. So Paul says in the midst of trial, in the midst of storm, that we as God's people should rejoice in hope. But then he says, the phrase that I'm picking up on is patient in tribulation. What an idea. In the midst of difficulty, in the midst of storm, don't be overly anxious to get out of the problem. Don't be overwhelmed that you have to change the situation overnight. This causes people to make bad decisions. This causes people to, to, to not wait upon God, to, not, to lean on their own understanding. And when you understand that many of the problems we face... Let's say that if I am in a bad, because that keeps coming to mind, if I'm in a bad or a difficult marriage, you're not going to change that bad or difficult marriage overnight. If it took 10 years or 3 years or 2 years or 20 years to get to that point, you're not going to change that through one seminar. You're not going to change that ultimately through one weekend to remember. You should go to weekend to remember because it is powerful. It is life-changing. But it takes work. It takes effort. So you have to be patient in problems or you will faint. You will quit. Proverbs 24, I think, verse 2 or verse 6 says, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. If you quit in the day of difficulty, in the, dif the day of trial, it's because you lack strength. It's not because the problem is too big. What an insightful idea. If you give up in the midst of the storm, it's not because the storm was too big. It was because you lacked the strength to persevere. So the old King James Bible says your strength is small. You have little strength when you can have big strength. 
So my encouragement is be patient in problems. Again, back to the couple I was sharing about, they're concerned about a number of their children that are on drugs. Okay? And I said, you don't want to lose the concern because that because you want to be constant in prayer. That's the last part of 12, Romans 12.12. 12. You want to always be praying about the situation. You want to pray without ceasing. There should be an effectual, fervent prayer. How can you have effectual and fervency in your prayer if you are relaxed, if you are not really concerned? So when the Bible is talking about being careful for nothing or, quote-unquote, being anxious for nothing, it's not saying don't be concerned. It's not saying don't care about the situation. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Paul says the cares of all the churches are overwhelming me on a regular basis. I'm paraphrasing. The same man that said, don't be careful for nothing, says all the cares of the churches are I'm burdened by them. So what's the point that God wants us to get? The point God wants us to get is where to cast our cares upon him. If we keep them, if we keep the burdens alone, if we carry them by ourselves, we'll be overwhelmed. So be patient in the midst of your problems. Again, I want to say this again. The same way you and I get out of problems is the same way we get into them. Generally, that's one step at a time. Okay? If you are in the midst of a bad relationship, one of the best things you could do is look at what did I do wrong, or if you like better, what could I have done better? Right? That, that makes you better prepared uh, in dealing with this relationship and if you're not married how to deal with another relationship hopefully you will look to get out of the one you're in if you are looking at the fruit of of disobedient rebellious children again first thing I would say is Adam and Eve I would suspect provided their children the same training yet one was righteous and the other was wicked Cain still killed his brother and so sometimes you could do all the right things and your children still go astray. God's children do. But for most of us, if we're honest, if we really have a good understanding of Scripture and we're honest with ourselves, there's things we could have done better. And if our kids are entitled, if our kids are disrespectful, if our children are not willing to follow our lead, then we should examine what did I do or not do that could have been done differently. And that's what I mean by being patient. See, when you take some responsibility for the outcome, it should create a level of empathy which provides you the ability to be patient so you can wait on God's timing, so that you can, yes, rejoice in hope that what you are believing God for is going to come to pass. That should create a sense of joy. We don't just have joy unspeakable in joy itself, what we have joy in is something that's tangible, something that's real. So it is joy unspeakable because there is something that we are holding on to, a truth, a promise. For the Lord Jesus, in Hebrews 12, it says, Because of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So Jesus rejoiced in hope. What was the hope? There was a joy set before him that through the cross, his people would be saved. Okay, so you have to do what Jesus did, rejoice in hope, but also be patient in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the storm, right? Because again, you didn't get into that problem overnight. So why complain to God and murmur or to friends or to others, take responsibility and say, you know, if I had more better counsel, if I understood better, I would have made better choices. Don't carry unnecessary guilt. That's not smart. That doesn't help. That that paralyzes. You know? That's why... Anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm tempted to expand on that, but I'm not going to. I'll just say, don't do that, because that destroys your hope. But the text says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Since I'm stationary, let me, let me, let me read the exact text as I finish up here. You know, my, encourage, my encouragement is... I see a lot of people who are in the midst of storms or difficulty, and as I sit or talk with them, I'm like, to me, you, you didn't get there overnight. So be patient that there's going to be a process. That doesn't mean you lack faith. Believe God for a miracle. 
Believe God to change it overnight. Right? There's your tension. Believe God to change it overnight. Like David. God says, David, I'm going to kill your son. Or if you like better, I'm going to take your son's life for your sin. That didn't stop David from praying and asking God to be merciful. There's your tension. David knew the will of God. That didn't stop him from praying for God to do something different. A lot of people use the will of God as a way to be slothful, complacent in prayer. All right? So, use the Bible as your example. David knew the will of God. Jesus knew the will of the Father. He knew he was supposed to go to the cross. He wasn't passive in asking the Father to remove the cup. If you're thinking rightly, or logically, better word, logically, not rightly, because logic is not always the best way to think about the Bible. But if you're thinking logically, Jesus should not be asking the Father to remove a cup from him when the Father told him, that he was going to have to drink the cup. He knew what the will of the Father was. At 12 years old, he said to his parents, didn't you know I would be about my father's business? He knew before he went to Gethsemane that it was, the, it was the will of the Father or it was the will of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for Christ to die on the cross. Yet knowing the will of the Father didn't make him passive in his prayer. There's a good nugget of wisdom there in how you should pray. I hear a lot of people praying about stuff. Well, I don't know if it's the will of God to do this or the will of God to do that. And so they don't pray about it. I call that laziness. God never told you and I to figure out his will. If God doesn't clearly say something's not his will in scripture, you have grounds to pray based on one text alone. If you delight yourself in me, God says, I will give you the desire of your heart. Delight yourself in me, and I'll give you the desire of your heart. So there are some things that God does because he loves his children. I know it sounds good that God does everything for his glory. Of course he does. God will never give me or provide you or me something that is contrary to his glory, that does not honor him, that does not glorify him. But by that, don't make that just a cold, sterile doctrine that it takes away the fact that our God also, our God also is concerned about what concerns us. And like any parent, he does things also to make his children happy. And if your children are unsaved, if your children are on drugs, if you are struggling financially, if your body is racked with pain because of some sickness or disease or some terminal uh, uh, diagnosis, I call it a terminal diagnosis, that doesn't mean it is terminal, but that's what the doctor said. I don't think you have to at all figure out if it's God's will to heal you, to deliver you, to save the children. I, I don't spend any energy trying to figure any of those things out. What I do is I go to God expecting that as a loving father, if I being evil know how to give good gifts to my children, then my father knows how to give good gifts to his children. Right? If me as an evil guy, you know, think about it. God get God gets a bad rap often. You know? People sometimes think they're more loving than God is. They think they're more thoughtful than God is, more considerate. You know? That's why we ask questions like how could God allow this thing to happen in his world? How could God allow Hurricane Dorian to happen? As if we're more sensitive, more wise, more intelligent more loving, more concerned, more merciful, more gracious than the creator of the universe. Are we kidding? Of course we're not. There's some things we just don't understand and, and that's where you go to Deuteronomy 28, 28. The secret things belong to the Lord. Those things that are revealed belong to us and our children. There's some things that, that are secret. They're not made for you and I to figure out on this side of eternity, but they will make sense. But Romans 12, 12 says this, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. That's like praying without ceasing, always being ready to pray. I love that for those phrases, rejoicing in hope, or being joyful in the hope that you have. Um, patient in tribulation, again, another very unique idea. Most people don't want to be patient in the midst of trouble or trial or difficulty or pressure or suffering. We just want to be released from it. Again, sometimes 
what it took to get me into the problem is what it's going to take to get me out of it, right? If I have a failing business and I was in that business for six years and it took three of those six years to get me to the point that I am, then maybe I need to be patient that it's gonna take a year or so to get out of it, all right? So that's all I wanna say. I didn't really have anything special planned and usually that's why I go longer because I'm just kind of winging it. But I hope you found something helpful. Again, my nugget of wisdom is be patient in problems. Don't be patient with them. Notice I chose the word in. You should circle it. I chose the word in for a reason. I was thinking, should I say with? No, you don't want to be patient with problems. You don't want to be patient with your children on drugs. You don't want to be patient with your husband as an alcoholic. You know, the patience is not so much for the person on the other end. The patience is for you. It's to help keep you calm, to keep you from losing your mind, to keep you from losing hope and joy, to keep you from destroying your faith, because faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So your faith must remain strong in God if you're going to see God do things on your behalf. So the patience is more for us than it is about the situation. So be patient in problems, not with the problems. All right? I hope you see the, the nuance there. Anyway, listen, guys. Have a great day. I hope you found something helpful as usual. Share, like, comment, you know, let me know your thoughts. If something you agree with, disagree with.